Here's a way to think about it. You're always looking at the world through a framework of reference. And you have to do that because there isn't very much of you. You can't see the whole world at once. And in fact, the amount of the world you actually see is so small you can't believe it. The central part of your vision is zipping around producing a pretty high resolution representation of exactly what you're looking at. But outside of that center, like if I look at you, I can't see her eyes. I can see her glasses, but barely. I can't even tell whether you're male or female. Um, the person past that, I can't see at all. Now you don't notice that, you know. You don't notice that you're that blind because your, your central vision is always popping around, illuminating that tiny space. But you're so damn blind, it's just mind boggling. And I'm sure some of you have seen the invisible gorilla video, you know, where a gorilla comes into the video and you don't notice, which is somewhat shocking because you would think that you would notice a gorilla. But what happens is that you actually don't notice something unless it interferes with what you're doing. And because what are you going to do? Notice everything? You can't do that. You can hardly notice anything. So what you do is you pick something to focus on. It's usually something that you value because why else would you focus on it? So that means that your value system determines the direction of your perception. Bloody well think about that for a minute. That's a Buddhist idea, right? People, people live in a kind of illusion. And sometimes that illusion causes suffering and they can transform the way they look at the world and that can release them from their suffering. But the idea that you do live in an illusion, well, I don't know if it's exactly an illusion, but you certainly do live within a, a framework of perception that's determined by your values. Now that is so weird. You know, because we never think of the world as something that reveals itself through our values. But of course it, of course it does. Because you look at what you want. You aim at what you want. And once you've aimed, the world lays itself out for you. And, that, and that's exactly how perception works. That's why I represented it this way. You're always somewhere. That's point A. And that's somewhere in some place and some time. And you always have some notion about what you want to hap have happen next. You know, you're going to go to the next class maybe. You, you've got a plan after this. In this class you have a plan. You're hoping to learn something, I presume. And maybe you have a goal with regards to a grade and that's nested inside your desire to get a degree and that's nested inside your desire to be educated and to have a career and, 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 and have a successful life. So, attending to me at the moment, the reason you're doing that is because all of those values exist within you simultaneously, focusing your attention. And so, you're attending to me and not to something else, assuming that all of you with your computers open aren't surfing the web, which you might be, but assuming that you're focusing, whatever you're focusing on is directed by what you value. And some of that can be unconscious. In fact, a lot of it is unconscious. Because you know it's very difficult for you to get control of what you pay attention to. You know what that's like. You're trying to study kind of a boring paper. Christ, your attention is just like everywhere, you know. Maybe you'll vacuum under the bed instead of doing the paper, reading the paper, you know. You can't get a grip on that thing, so your attention has an autonomy. And that's another psychoanalytic idea, you know, because you kind of think, well, you're in control. It's like, really? You ever try telling yourself what to do? Does the, how does that work for you? I'm going to go to the gym three times a week. Right, sure you are. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to quit eating sugar for a month. It's like, how long does that last? It's like 15 minutes, and you're eating like three chocolate bars. So, you're, this is, and this is Freud's central insight, I would say, you're an autonomous group of spiritual agents, let's say, personalities. And they don't really get along very well. And you, the ego, will say, is by no means necessarily in charge. And that's a very strange thing to realize. But you can really realize that by noticing how little control you have over your attentional focus. Okay, so, you've got your point A. You're going to point B, you're always doing that, you inhabit a structure of value and it changes what the point A is and what the point B is, but the structure itself doesn't change. And when you're looking at the world, what you see is not objects, you see tools and they make you happy. Those are things that facilitate your movement forward. And you see obstacles and those are things that make you unhappy. And when you encounter an obstacle, one of the problems is, is well, you don't get 
to where you're going, and that's a problem. But the other problem is, if you encounter an obstacle, the frame might be wrong. Right, because you never know, it might be just something that you could detour around real easily it might be a fatal flaw in your whole plan and so obstacles have this dual nature, they get in your way but they can also take your plan down and so they can produce anxiety so, my point is, and this, there's a book called uh, Visual An Ecological Approach to Visual Perception, it's a great book um, by Gibson, J.J. Gibson, if I remember correctly and, this is Although I thought of this a while back, I realized eventually that it was a variant of his theory and what he believed was that when people looked at the world, they saw value first and, and inferred objects second. So for example, for Gibson, if you're standing by a cliff, you don't see a cliff and then think about the fact that you might fall and then feel frightened. You see a falling off place and part of the seeing of that, part of the act of seeing is being afraid of that because your eyes are connected right to your emotional systems and part of what your eyes do is tell you what the object is but your eyes do all sorts of other things like they prepare you for action they prepare you for gripping they prepare you for emotion and, and none of that actually requires the, the existence necessarily the existence of your perception of the object so there are people who have blind sight and if you show them so they think they can't see but if you flash them an angry face they'll show a skin conductance response and that's because the visual pathways to the amygdala which does face emo facial emotional processing can still be active, these are people who've usually had a stroke so their eyes are okay but they've de destroyed the visual cortex so, so anyways it's perfectly plausible that at least at one level of analysis when you look at something you see its utility first so you see a chair and you might say a chair is an object but I wouldn't say that a beanbag's a chair, and a stump is a chair and they don't share much in common except that you can sit on them and so, you know, the chair is, just, the chair is basically conceptualized by its functional utility and when you look at a chair, what you perceive it's, is its functional utility and the chair tells you what to do it says, sit on me, and so that and there are people who have prefrontal damage and they engage in something called utilization behavior and if they're walking down a hallway and there's a door open, they have to walk through it they can't not do what the object tells them to do that's called utilization behavior so, that's how the world is laid out and I would say, inside that domain you're in the predictable world, you're in the world that you understand it, that you know and that if you hit an obstacle or if you're outside that domain, you're in the unknown, you're in unknown territory <laughs>